there's none of, uh, you know, they didn't try to leverage, negotiate. You know, they just wanted me to know as the head coach that these things are now going on in college football, which I knew, but when you get the first-hand examples of it, of this school offered me this much to go there at this time, those are very real things. Are when you, you used to share what, what any of those schools are? No. Are there repeat offenders? Oh, yeah. So oh, you're yeah. hearing the same. Yeah, there's, you know, I mean, one school did it with three different players. You know, it was great. No, no, no. And the, the money offers kept getting better. Wow. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's just part of college football. And, you know, you can complain about it, but it doesn't do you any good. You just got to embrace it. Again, we, we want our players to maximize their opportunities. Now, what happens when the coaches complain about it, it's like, well, you know, these coaches are making all the money, and they, it's, it's no, that there's also examples of players being told, hey, if you go into the portal and come here, we'll give you this, and then they go there and don't get this. And so there's gotta be a way to protect the players that if they really are gonna leave a school they're about to get a degree in, go in the portal and transfer to another school, what assurance do they have that they're gonna get what the school told them in recruiting? So that happens a lot too. And so I think at times when we say we want guardrails and regulation and all that, it's not just to protect coaches and make our jobs easier, but some of it is to protect the players. Well, there's a lot of stories of players transferring and then not getting what they were told. How substantial were the offers? Oh, there was <laughs> approximately <laughs> up to? I would say the, probably the lowest one was 150 and the highest one who stayed was probably close to about 500,000. Does it happen at all within the, we've seen players transfer within the conference. Any kind of gentleman's agreement for the guys in the ACC? I'll say this, that of the schools that approached our players, none of them were in the ACC. When you use the word tampering, that's something they don't play around with in the professional ranks. Um, is, is there some type of regulation you think that needs to be brought down? There's you know, no in the enforcement, college? there's no regulation right now. So that's why I just, I've said this many times, I wish they just eliminate the rules. Because right now the rules only penalize the people who follow them. Do you have faith in Charlie Baker that something will be done? I don't know enough about I, mean, I don't know enough about Charlie Baker. I think it's a very difficult uh, problem because all the state laws now are so different. And you know, it's when you're asking Congress and the federal government to help you, you really know you have issues. Um, <laughs> And I, I don't think, I think there's things going on in our country, quite frankly, that are more important for our national well-being than name, image, likeness. Is this really what we want our national government? But the problem is that there's just so many different state rules and regulations, and I think the SEC commissioner worded very well when he said there's almost like a race to the bottom. And so when state laws are stating that your state law, the NCAA can't investigate you. The NCAA is a volunteer organization. You volunteer to belong to it, and you join an organization as a volunteer, and you accept the rules that they've established. Uh, so it's just, you know, it's in a major state of flux. The game's never been more popular. I still think college football is a wonderful, great sport. Um, we're still graduating players and giving them life experiences they wouldn't otherwise get. And they're getting scholarships and now they're getting collective money. You know, so, you know, it's not sound the alarms. This thing's about to be destroyed. It's, it's not a disaster. I think in a lot of ways it's never been better. But I think if you're in this, you know, you always have opinions of what could make it even better. And I think if we can come up with ways that uh, protect the players and have a little bit more consistency to rules and regulations. Right with a lot of things, you just want to know what the rules are. Tell me what the rules are and I'll follow them. And right now, there's just inconsistency with that. And the NCAA, you know, their hands are tied. It's, it's, people are critical of enforcement, but I, I don't know if I want to work in enforcement right now either. Dave, so of course, fall camp starts in like four or five days. What has you most excited about this group of Demon Deacons, and what do you hope to see out of your team over the next three or four weeks as you gear up for that season opener? Uh, to me, last every year I'm excited because, like, okay, what's going to unfold? Every team is a new team. 
uh, every season is a new season. There's going to be new challenges. There's going to be new heartaches. There's going to be more surprises. It's the emotional roller coaster we live on as a college football coach. For me at Wake, it's always who's the three, four, five players that nobody's talking about that all of a sudden next year become breakout stars. And that's why we've been able to sustain it. If you always look at, well, you know, Wake had this guy recruited and, you know, he was a two-star guy and they're going to, you know, it's these guys that are always developing and getting better. And, you know, Kendron Wayman's a great example. And look what Keyshawn Williams has done. And the year Jamal Banks had last year. And last year nobody was talking about him. And we'll have guys like that this year. I don't know if it's Nick Sharp or Matt Goldman or Jacob Roberts or Dylan Hazen. But these guys have been in our program three, four, or five years, and they're good players, and they're going to have their chance to play. Now, their challenge is they haven't had to do it 12 straight weeks, like I said, with Mitch. So for every position, it's not can you do it for a week or two weeks. Is you Can you sustain a, a level of performance that requires preparation for 12 straight weeks? And that's the challenge of it. And there's guys that can do it and there's guys that can. And that's why you have to have depth. Because, Go ahead. because of the size of the school, being as small as it is, are there inherent NIL challenges because you don't have the money to work with that, that other schools do have? Does that put you at a disadvantage? I mean, that, that for us right now, um, we're certainly not at an advantage with it, but I don't think we're the bottom of the league either. You know, our formula is always going to be based around our institution, the value of our degree. Our players didn't stay because, you know, something got matched or bettered. Most of them stayed because they spent three years of their life working hard to get a Wake Forest degree, and there's a value in that degree. Our scholarship is worth eighty-five, ninety thousand dollars a year, and if you're just suddenly going to leave and you know go to another school that doesn't have the same academic prowess, you may be getting more money, but you're also giving something up. Well, he's been in those meetings with Sam and Coach R every day for three, four years. So there's there are going to be no surprises of how we game plan, how we prepare. And one of the reasons I think we have such faith in Mitch is very few backups can prepare like they're the starter. Like you can do that for a week or two weeks, but after a while, well, Sam's the starter. You know, why would I put in this much work? Mitch never took his foot off the, foot off the gas when he was a backup. So one of the cliches in coaching, right, you tell all the backups, hey, you're a play away from being the starter. And very few of them can actually prepare that way for a whole year. Once six, seven, eight games and they're not the starter, I think it's human nature. Well, what's the point? Next year's my year. I'll back off. Mitch never backed off. And so I think he's been preparing as the starter for three years. And now that it's his role, I don't think anything will change for him during the week. But now game day is different. Now you got to go out there and do it against real teams with a scoreboard. You know that the interception you throw in practice isn't shake it off. It's it's real. How important is it? How much of an advantage is it to have a guy who's been in the system, who knows, especially your offense, and has run it and, and is that well versed in it for three years to come in and now be the starter? Instead yes, of having to I mean it's in, an incredible advantage. You know, one of the things that we take pride in is I think we're one of the few schools in the country that hasn't been ever reliant on a transfer quarterback. John Wolford, we recruited, we developed, still playing. You know, after him, Kendall Hinton, after him, Jamie Newman, after him, Sam Hartman, now it's Mitch Griffiths. You know, we've recruited and developed all of our own quarterbacks. And what I'm real happy about is you got a guy like Mitch that could have left a year ago or two years ago and probably gone somewhere else and started, but he likes what we do, he likes how he's coached, and he knew what was ahead of him. So he was willing to be patient and stay and wait his turn. And that's very rare in college athletics, especially at that position right now. And he did get a start for it last year, son. Did they get he got to st that? start one game, um, and he did a really good job in it. And you know, now that was our opener, and you know, we played an FCS team, and he knows that. Uh, he, he knows that 
you know, that game was, you know, the margin of error on that game is going to be greater than even it is this year. This year we opened with an FCS playoff team. So that preparation from last year has to be better this year. So he'll, he'll be ready. Dave, Dave, William, I wanted to get in one question. Me, yeah. David, I, I was at Richmond 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Age has its, has its occasional age experience. Yeah, there you go. Experience. Well, speaking of experience, since you've been in the league, Christophe, you've had time to observe. Is the arrangement with Notre Dame, where you play them almost as frequently as some conference finals? Not almost. We've well, played them. well in, in the future. Yeah, schedule. this is our fourth game against Notre Dame, and I've only coached against Georgia Tech once, and I've never coached against Miami. Wow. Is, is, is that, has that arrangement been good for the league? Let's recognize the reality of it. Part of our TV deal and our revenues we get, it's because those home games with Notre Dame are baked into that. You know, so, uh, you know, for us, it makes it difficult for us to schedule nine ACC games, right? Because in any year, a third of our teams are going to play Notre Dame. And, you know, I don't think we, financially we want to give that up because I'm sure part of our ESPN deal is the fact that every year two or three or four games against Notre Dame are going to be ACC media properties. Uh, so that's a real part of it. And then you have teams like Clemson, who every year is going to play South Carolina. You have Florida State, who every year is going to play Florida. You have Louisville is going to play Kentucky, right? So those games now start adding up that you don't want to play so many of those games that you take yourself out of the playoff race. So, yes, I think it's a good arrangement. Notre Dame is a national brand. A lot of people watch them. Every time that we play them, there's how many millions of eyes on ACC football. And again, like I said, clearly that arrangement is beneficial to us financially. Wake Forest benefits from five ACC schools and Notre Dame every year. And then how essential for the perception of the league nationally? The league's lost 28 regular season games. Well, does that include the uh, the year that they were? Does that include when Clemson beat them in the? That's not a regular season. Regular season. It, it's uh, a, it's you know, a so you're like you're sounding like a Notre Dame homer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give Clemson credit for beating yeah. them in twenty. Yeah. So, but yeah, before I mean, that, it would have been two thousand seven. Absolutely. I mean, that's they're a good program and they're a good football team and they've been nationally ranked. Um, and yeah, we need we need to start beating. them. Now, I think we've won a lot of other games nationally. You know, you can isolate any one individual stat to make yourself look good or bad. I do that all the time in recruiting to help us. <laughs> and the team's recruiting against it, use it against us. Um, but, yeah, it's, you know, every time we play them, we root for the ACC team because I think that'll help our ability to be nationally ranked and get into the playoffs. Dave, I wanted to get in one question about your defense as far as what, what, what do you want their identity to be in 2020? Uh, I, I'd say, you know, identity, you know, I, you know, again, I hate the cliche game. We're going to be aggressive. We're going to be disruptive. We, I mean, it's every coach says that, right? So bottom line, we got to create more turnovers. We've got to give up less big plays. Last year, we defended the run better than we've ever defended the run at Wake Forest. We were better on first and second down than we've been in years. We gave up too many explosive plays, and we didn't generate turnovers. So... To me, those are the big goals for our defense going into camp is, number one, create more turnovers. Number two, give up less explosive plays and become a better third down and a better red zone defense. And if we can get better at those four things, those things usually translate to more wins. you spend an inordinate amount of time practicing those situations. Last year is the worst year we've had in six years on one score games. Three times last year we had the ball with two minutes left and a chance to win a football game and we didn't win any of those games. We had a chance to be Clemson with a two minute drill, North Carolina with a two minute drill and Duke with a two minute drill. 0 for 3. And if you look at those previous years, those are the games we found a way to win. Right, Louisville the year before, NC State. Uh, so we're going to have to practice those situations more and more and more. So our players 
when we get in those situations are comfortable. Now, I think already we practice those things a disproportional amount of time. But it doesn't matter how much you practice it if you're not good at it. So, and especially with a new quarterback. I think Jacob Roberts is really going to help us. Um, you know, we had him in spring football. Uh, you know, we brought in a, a number of defensive tackles, Nick Helbig and, uh, you know, Bryce Gaines. You know, we're, we're, I think we've got numbers at the position, and we just need to cream the rise of the top. You mentioned tampering while you were on the podium. I wonder what do you think can be done about it? Do you want to see federal legislation like that? Other coaches or, or what can I don't know if the out? federal legislation is going to change the tampering. Um, you know, I, I just think in, until there's enforcement, until, you know, coaches lose their jobs over it or, you know, but, you know, so many of the tampering, it, it does benefit the player, right? And in some ways it's unfair. Like this whole notion, like what good player at a good school who's getting collective money is going to go in the portal and give all that up without knowing what he's going to get. I mean, the whole notion that this is the way it should be done, I mean, would you quit your job until you had another job? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's not, it's not fair to the players. You know, so it happens because, I mean, players are, are educated and they're smart and, you know, they're not going to go into the portal if they're a good player unless they know where they're going to go and what they're getting. Uh, so the, the system right now is, is broken. Um, I think we'd like it to be fixed in a way that's better for everybody, including the players. How do you recreate the character of Wake Forest to those players? How do I what? Recreate the character of Wake Forest to those players. What do you mean recreate? Just bring it back to them. Like, like they've been uncommitted from this, and then you bring it back to um, the character that you've created for well my, my whole thing with the portal and I tell our coaches this and our entire staff this is the way that we're going to win the portal is not losing players to the portal and again I, I think well this is correct I think last year we lost the second fewest players in the country to the portal so you know people want to take the negative and talk about Sam and Rondell I want to take the positive and talk about all the players who were tampered with who were offered money who chose to stay when you and know so, that, oh. and let me just finish that the way that we do that is we provide an experience to them that they don't want to leave. So you don't convince them to stay once they think of leaving. They don't want to leave because of their day in day out experience. So that's to me like is the, you know people rank the portal classes and we're always at the bottom. At Wake Forest, it's hard to get guys in the portal. It's you know, it's, it's hard for us to, you know, a lot of the players, they, they'll lose so many credits if they come to our place that academically it's not worth them to make that transfer. So, you know, a lot of the transfers we've gotten come from Harvard, Stanford, Vanderbilt, like like type institutions, Richmond, Villanova. Those have been a lot of our transfers because they can get into our graduate school or they come from schools that their, their credits will transfer. But again, I think to the point that a player has an offer and he thinks about it, they're only looking for those things if they're not having a good experience. When these guys are telling you about some of these issues, um, does that add an extra pressure to you of, I need to do this, this, this to get them to stay? And how do no, you create that program? No, because the players, I mean, our players are great. They told me after the window was closed, they already decided to stay. They just told me, coach, you just need to know this is going on. Not asking for anything. I just thought you should know that I was offered this by this school, and I'm grateful that they trust me enough to share that. Hey, what has Kevin Higgins meant to your program? Oh my God, it's you know that could be another half hour. <laughs> First of all, Kevin was one of my mentors as a coach. I worked with him in '93 at Lehigh and for him '94 and '95, um, and he just to me is one of the most high character, do right, in it for all the right reasons coaches have ever worked with. And because Kevin has been a head coach so long, he's really been my right hand guy in any head coach decision. So if there's ever a head coaching decision that this is what I'm thinking of doing and it's gonna affect the whole team, 
Kevin's the guy I've always run those things by before I, I do it. And there's times, Dave, I agree. Dave, would you consider this? This might be the impact of doing this. His ability to see the big picture uh, is one of the best coaches I've ever worked with. And I'm, I mean, he's a close, dear personal friend. I mean, Kevin and I are more than colleagues. You know, I consider Kevin one of my very best friends in the whole world. Dave, December has become difficult for coaches because you've got the portal window open. You've got early signing period, and in your case, pretty much every year, preparing for postseason play. Do you want to see changes in the system or the calendar? Yeah, I would. Um, what would you do? Well, I, I think, you know, somehow coming up with a calendar that your high school recruiting, your portal recruiting, all don't get mixed together. It'd almost be nice, you know, if, if those could be spaced out in different times. Because what's happening to high school players is they're committed to a school for six months or eight months. And then in December, they're getting dumped because the school found somebody in the portal that can help them sooner. Um, and so that's not, I don't think that's good for high school football players. Um, now, you know, we don't do that. If we're committed to a high school player and he's committed to us, there's a great player available in the portal. If we're committed to that player, we're gonna honor that commitment. But, you know, we've gotten a number of commitments from guys that were dumped a week or three days before. Now that happened anyways with high school recruits, but now with the volume of transfers, that's a more frequent occurrence. You've had a number of guys that missed spring camp that were on track to be ready in the fall. Are they still on track? Are you expecting to get a few folks going in the Yeah, fall? well, I think... And do you have anybody that's going to be missing fall? Yeah, we'll, we'll get the final medical report uh, on Sunday. I'll, I'll give you a call. I'll share that with you on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not helping out any other schools with their injury report right now. <laughs> so it's a long way to the first kickoff day. It's a long way to the first practice. <laughs> so, we, well, most of those guys will be back. A few guys, you know, there's a, a handful of guys that'll be out for the season. A few guys out for a few months. And some guys will miss a few weeks in camp. I'm sure my readers will rest easy with that sentence. What's that? I'm sure my readers will rest easy with that sentence. We'll, we'll, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. You mentioned earlier two-minute proficiency in practicing even, even more so because of the rules changes. Yeah, because the clock situations are now different and what stops the clock and when does it happen and there's so many more nuances to it. Uh, you know, it's just, that's something to me should help Wake Forest. We have smart players, but we'll have to drill those things. And we've even talked about it uh, as a staff of different two-minute situations now based on the clock rules. So that's fun. I, I enjoy that stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, situational football, that's my favorite thing to coach. Do you, do you have somebody either upstairs or, or even downstairs on your headset in terms of clock management? Oh, yeah. And, you know, yeah. Timeout here. We have a guy on the sideline right next to me okay. of, you know, timeout management, uh, all those type of things. Who is that on your staff? Um, I have, uh, we have people on the staff here. Coach <laughs> <laughs> said earlier, you hope to create more turnovers this fall. But at the same time, when you try to strip the ball to create a fumble, you risk letting the guy slip through. No, it's, it's, like it's, right? it's not, there's times to do that, and there's times to secure the tackle. So you're absolutely right. If you're one-on-one -on -one with the guy and he sees you, you're not going to try to punch it out. You've got to tackle him. But when you're coming from the side and you're not seen, like we teach when the strip's appropriate, and we teach when getting him on the ground is the priority. What's that? If you come underneath it, you better be right. So. Hey, Coach Carson, Jen Lewis Couple with more, Usage guys. Media and Three Chicks in a Pod. And I think somebody kind of asked this similar question, but I couldn't quite hear the answer. But who is someone you've looked at on the field and you're like, dang, I did good bringing him on. I mean, that I br did good by bringing them to Wake Forest? Yes. I can give you 90 players. <laughs> okay. We have 110 guys to camp. 
And one of the things I love about Wake Forest is I'd say 90% of them, oh my God, I like, you know, like we have a group of 18 to 22 year olds. We have certainly a percentage of what I'd call knuckleheads. <laughs> you know, they don't always do everything right, but most of our players, I have them over the house, they interact with my family, and they're just, they're awesome human beings. So that's one of the advantages of working at Wake is I get to coach kids like that. That's awesome. Now, looking back on the last couple of seasons, is there a play that stands out that just impresses you that you didn't have much to do cultivate during game day? Yeah, I mean, a lot of, uh, you know, scramble plays. I mean, if you look at uh, the play we made against Syracuse in overtime two years ago in a Torian Perry, you know, looked like the rubber band man and went against his body and caught a game-winning touchdown. Great. I mean, that was just an incredible individual effort by a player to make a play that won us a game. Yeah. And so, you know, our plays and schemes are really, really important, but, you know, players are really, really important, too. You've done a great job. Thank you. Bro. Thank you. So do you like those improvisational plays, or do you cringe a little bit? Because your quarterback just said that's his favorite one. The more of those you can make, the better you are, right? There's only X amount of plays in a game that are going to work by design. And I think the difference between good plays and bad plays on both sides of the ball is when the primary play breaks down, how do you avoid the sacks and make those plays touchdowns? He just said he loves throwing off platform. And, you know, that's, that's his strength. He can throw from multiple arm angles. He improvises. He's athletic. Um, I think he'll make a lot of plays this year outside the design of the play. With AT Two more guys. Two more. With AT Perry, uh, a big part of your offense on target. Who on the wide receiver court do you think? Uh, we have four receivers coming back that caught over 500 yards. Of all of our concerns, talent and depth at receiver is not one of them. We might have as good a wide receiver room as there is in the country. And how important, you talk about you have experienced guys who are going to play offensive line. How important is it that they play together for a while? Or is it? It's important, but they've had a whole spring. They're going to have a whole camp. Um, and we have more depth at that position than we've ever had. Whether Matt Galbin or Nick Sharp starts, the others, good depth. Uh, George Sell had a great spring. Um, I'm really excited at a tackle about Zach Vaughn and C.J. Elmanis and Eric Russell. Like, we're, we're starting to get some depth there. I mean, it's, we'll be able to play seven or eight guys on the O-line. And we've gone into a lot of years with six or five. So hopefully we don't need them, but we probably will. So, all right, thanks, everybody. Thanks.